Well, good morning. You know, uh, as we've been going through the book of Colossians in the Bible, I've been saying this really every week, and that is that everything we need is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you really believe that? It's in times that are trying, like now, that we really begin to find out. First, what do we really need? And secondly, can we find that in Jesus Christ? In Colossians, in chapter 1, especially verses 15 through 19, we saw some pretty amazing things about Christ. The reason everything we need is found in Christ is because of who he is. And we need to know who he is. And because of what he has done. We saw in those verses that he is the creator. That he is the one who is before all things. And that by him, that verse said, all things consist or adhere. He's the glue that holds the universe together. We saw that all things were not only made by him, but for him. And everything finds its purpose, including you, in him. We saw that he is the firstborn from the dead, that is the path breaker, the one who conquered death, that he is the head of his body, the church. We saw that he is the visible image, that passage said, the visible image of the invisible God, and that all the fullness of the Godhead finds its completeness and dwells in him. Now, as we pick up in verse 21 of Colossians 1, I want you to notice how the Apostle Paul descends from these vast generalizations and vast explanations of God that he creates all things visible, invisible, before all things, from these vast picture all the way down to the closest, most personal application. In those verses preceding this, we see that this is what's true about God. Now we find, okay, here's what's true about you. We pick up in verse 21. It says once, and you might circle this, you. Once, before you came to Christ as Savior, once, at a time in your life, whether you knew it or not, once you were alienated, separated from God, and look, you were enemies in your minds, in your heart, because of your evil behavior. The Bible declares that there is a huge gulf between man, and God. In that inseparable gulf, that chasm, without Christ, you are alienated from God. And the signs of you being alienated, for example, are that you don't really like to talk about God, or you have no desire to do His will. You want to do what you want to do. That's the very definition of sin. I do what I want to do. And this alienation doesn't end with just being indifferent toward God, just being apathetic toward God. It actually leads to hostility towards God and towards the things of God. A person without Christ may feel some kind of a, oh, kind of a complacent regard towards a God of their own imagination. And a person without Christ may be uh, a good person in the eyes of other people. But in their hearts, there is an aversion, a hostility to the true and living God. And really, isn't that a strange thing when you think about it? That there should be such hatred 
toward Jesus Christ, who is the creator. Isn't it odd that there would be such hatred and hostility and aversion towards God, who is the source of any blessings that we have? That's kind of illogical. I mean, it might be more understandable if he was a merciless, hating God, an uncaring God, but the opposite of that is true. And it's important that we see that. It's important that we understand when the Bible says that all around us, this life, it's not about flesh and blood. That's not the enemy. It is a spiritual war that is going on. And this animosity of man towards God, and towards the things of God. It is there because man, the scripture says, is utterly, totally depraved. I'm going to say something that is really not popular, but it's a truest. Man is not basically good. Man is not basically good and in fact you are alienated from God and you are under his righteous judgment for sin John 3 36 but when you turn to Jesus and you simply cry be merciful to me a sinner when you simply say in your heart of hearts I need you as my Savior. When you do that, miracle after miracle happens. And the first miracle is that your relationship with God changes, dramatically changes. We read in the next verse, verse 22, but now, now that you have turned to him, now he has reconciled you. So you were once alienated and now you've been brought back into a right relationship with God. You have been reconciled by Christ's physical body through death to present present you. Put your name in this. To present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. This is an amazing truth that you who believe, that's all you could do. There was no good work in you to do. There was no righteousness you could bring. You were totally helpless and hopeless, dependent, alienated from the God who loved you and who pursued you. And so now, you who have received that gift are now holy in God's sight because Christ Holiness now covers you. You are righteous because of Christ's righteousness. It is imputed or transferred to your account. It's an incredible thing. And then look at that verse at the end. It says, free from accusation. I would encourage you to write these words down somewhere. Circle this. Think about this. In the eyes of God, you are now free from accusation. That is a judicial term. That means every charge against you, every charge against you that you were guilty of is now gone. And you were guilty. You broke every law. You have lied. You have coveted and been envious of what others have. You have put other things and people in front of God, have you not? You have said, done, and thought. You have broken the law. You are guilty, and the judgment is death, eternal separation from God. And look, every charge against you has been dropped. You are now justified in God's eyes. This is vitally important theology, teaching, what you believe and don't believe. And what has now happened already in the legal sense 
is going to one day be completed in the physical realm as well. One day when Christ returns, you are going to be changed. And I would encourage you this week to read 1 Corinthians 15. Dwell on it. This old sin nature that is still a part of you on earth will be forever gone. And you will receive a glorified body, perfect, incapable of sin, recreated, fitted for an eternity in the heaven that God has created. An eternity with a holy God. Think of that. There is coming a day when we will be pure enough to be happy in the presence of the God whose holiness is a consuming fire because we will be perfect. And God's glory will cover us and be demonstrated in us. 1 Corinthians 2.9, you know the verse, but we often don't read verse 10. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Now that's a wonderful truth, and we sing, I could only imagine. But you know what? We're leaving off something. Listen to the next verse, verse 10. I'll read it again. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. In other words, there is much we don't have to imagine. Oh, there is much that is going to just overwhelm us in its wonder. But we are told we are going to have new bodies. We are going to be in the presence of God. We are going to be actively serving and worshiping and so much more. Well, look again at verse 22, if you would, in Colossians 1, at what has brought this about. It says, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. Now, one of the things that the book of Colossians stresses is the body and its relationship to the head. Remember in verse 18 it says that Christ is the head of his body, the church. But both the books of Colossians and 1 John were written especially, amongst other things, but especially to combat the heresy, the false teaching called Gnosticism. And one of the false teachings that came out of that, which is still with us today, because Satan's Errors and lies never die. He just repackages them. And the next generation thinks they've discovered something. The cult of Christian science. Now you may say, oh, pastor, that's not nice. I know people who are in Christian science and things, and they're good people. The religion itself is a cult. And Christian science and many of the New Age teachings and other things, focus on what is being combated here in this first century writing called docetism. It's in your notes. It's a Greek word that means seem to be. And this led to dualism where everything is in twos, spirit and physical, mind, matter, good and evil. And they said in their teaching that the mind or the, the spirit is good, but matter or physical, including the body, is evil. And so then they taught that everything that you see in the physical world around you has a spiritual counterpart. Therefore, only spirit exists. Matter only seems to exist. So when you have a physical problem, you're supposed to just say, I claim it's not there. It's really not there. Because that's evil. And so the Gnostics taught, just like Christian science and other groups today, that Christ appeared on earth in a spiritual body. 
And they say, since he had no physical body, he only, here's the docetism, he only seemed to suffer and bleed and die on the cross. Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, said the blood of Jesus is not efficacious. It is not beneficial. It is not real. It only seems to be. And so in verse 22, Paul is saying, no, you have been reconciled. You've been restored by Christ's physical body through death. The Holy Spirit is emphasizing this to us for a reason. In verse 20, Paul talked about the blood of Christ. Well, blood can only come from a physical organism. Listen to the Apostle John in 1 John, not the Gospel, but the Epistle 1 John. Chapter 1, he begins by saying, when he, listen to how he stresses the physical aspect. He says in verse 1, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen, we saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. In other words, he's saying he didn't just seem to be. He is real. Now, why is this important? And why would there be a teaching like that? The reason in this spiritual war is that Satan hates he hates the fact that God loved man so much that he became a man to rescue man. He hates it. He underestimated how far God would go. That Jesus would leave the glory of heaven and though perfect, come to this earth and taste death, experience death, for every man, so that we might be released. Satan hates the blood of Jesus that paid for your sins. That's why in liberal Protestant groups over the last half century, they have taken all the hymns out of the books that talk about the blood. We don't want to sing about nothing but the blood of Jesus. We don't want to sing about what can take away our sin? The blood, that's all out. We can't have that. But the Bible stresses it for a reason. Life is in the blood. Now, verse 23, so we are holy in his sight. And verse 23 says, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move, from the hope held out in the gospel. That's that good news message. It's what we're all about as a church. The death, burial, and resurrection. Everything comes out of that. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now look at the very first part of that verse. How do you continue in your faith? I mean, does this mean that you have to try and keep your salvation that God has given you as a gift? Does it mean that your salvation depends on you? Well, it can't mean that. Philippians 1.6 says we can be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, that is Christ, the good work of salvation, will perform it or complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will not lose one of my sheep. And many, many other verses. But this needs to be balanced. And it's often not. Those of us who teach eternal security, that when you have truly received the gift of God, of salvation, that God guarantees you heaven. God guarantees you forgiveness. Sometimes what is not stressed is what is referred to as the perseverance of the saints or the believers. In other words, Divine preservation always presupposes human perseverance. Now, no one can continue in the faith in his own strength any more than you can get salvation on your own strength. It takes the enabling grace of God from start 
to finish. But there is a human responsibility to continue in the faith and become established and firm, as the verse says, to not go back to the way of living that you did before you knew Christ. A human responsibility, but there is a divine enablement to carry out that responsibility. We've talked many times before, salvation has three parts, right? There are three aspects or meanings. There's a past, present, and future. The past part of your salvation, God did it all. He paid the price. He took care of your sin forever. And you are now justified before God. The future part of your salvation, your ultimate glory, is guaranteed. God has a place reserved in heaven for you, an inheritance, First Peter says, that cannot disappear or be taken away. But the present part, living in this life now, what is called sanctification, the living out of your salvation in this life, is a partnership. That is a participation. You have a part and God has a part. And your part, we know what it is. It is to walk with Christ, to walk in his light as he is in the light. It is to remain in him. It is to read his word and pray and serve and study and give and be a part of all that he has in this abundant life for you. Sanctification, that part of your salvation, means to be set apart for God's use. We are no longer pigs in this dirty world. We are sheep. We are no longer estranged from God. We've been reconciled to God. And we are to live like children of the king. We are no longer paupers. You are a prince or a princess. And we have a human responsibility with God's power to live that out. And so... In the outline, which you can also download, and you can download it afterwards as well, you'll notice a number of verses about rewards and loss of rewards. That has to do with how we live this life. You're going to be in heaven, but depending on your motivation of how you did things in this life, depending on how you treated people, depending on how you lived your life here, how did you take advantage of the opportunities God gave you? How did you use the time and the treasure and the talents and all that he has given you? God is going to reward you for that. Now, there will be loss of rewards, meaning that if I do something for somebody, but really the motivation for why I did it was about me, that was my reward right there. But when you do something for God, and maybe nobody even knows about it. Or you do something for God just out of pure love. Or you sacrifice in some way. God sees that. And he will reward it. What an incredible God we serve. Now verse 23, Paul says, I, Paul, at the very end of the verse, have become a servant of that gospel. And because he was telling people about Jesus Christ, because of that, he was terribly persecuted. They tried to kill him on a number of occasions. Paul suffered terribly. In fact, he was in prison facing execution before Nero when he penned this letter. And yet, he says in verse 24, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. Circle that word. For the sake of his body, which is the church. I say to circle the word because some use this verse to say that Christ's work of paying for our salvation wasn't finished. And so they say we ourselves, we need to have penance and indulgences and purgatory and other things that man has invented because we have to make up for what Christ 
did not finish. Well, first of all, it makes no sense because if Paul says in this verse that he supplied in his suffering what Christ failed to supply, whether well, there'd be nothing left for us to supply. But secondly, it's contrary to Scripture. You remember just before Jesus was arrested, before he went to the cross, he prayed to the Father in John 17, 4. He said, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Well, what was the work? Why did he come to this earth? Well, let's jump ahead. Look at Colossians 2.14. Here's the work. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. We were legally indebted because we broke God's law by sinning. And we deserve the penalty of death, which is eternal separation from the holy God. That's the work that Jesus came to earth to do. Look, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Oh, there's more, but we'll have to wait for chapter 2. That's an exciting part. Jesus' last words on the cross in John 19.30, it is finished. It is finished. And then it says he released his spirit. In Hebrews 10, 11 through 14, it says that Christ offered himself as the one sacrifice for sins forever. And then it says, then he sat down, which is a picture of being finished with the work. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. So looking back at verse 24, if that doesn't mean that we should try to complete the sufferings of Christ for salvation, which it clearly doesn't, well, then what does it mean? Well, this is interesting because remember, even though Christ, by means of the afflictions he endured, he rendered complete satisfaction to God as judge. But the enemies of Christ were not and are not satisfied. They hated Jesus, and they hate Jesus, and they wanted to add to his afflictions, but since he was no longer physically present on earth, their attacks, which are meant for Christ, come against who? The believers, Christians, his followers, his body. We are his body on earth. And in this sense, true believers are filling up or supplying what, as the enemy sees it, is lacking in the afflictions which Christ endured. 2 Corinthians 1.5 says, Christ's afflictions overflow towards us. Jesus said, he didn't pull any punches on this. He said, you're going to be hated. He said, in this world, you are going to suffer because you are connected to him. Jesus said, you will be hated by all men for my name's sake. Jesus said, if they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more them of his household, us. Do not be surprised if you turn on the news and see what seems like an attack against the values of Christ, that should not be a surprise. Do not be surprised when you turn on a movie and it seems to be about everything that God is not. Don't be surprised if you flip on a situation comedy and it's all about mocking God or the things of God? Do not be surprised if somebody stands up in some public arena and says something good about Jesus Christ that they are attacked or ridiculed. Jesus said exactly what was going to happen. And in fact, Jesus said 
if you live godly, all those who live godly in him will, not might, will suffer persecution. In this spiritual war, the enemy is attacking and will attack Christ by attacking his body. Do you remember when Paul, before he was a Christian, he was a religious person, he was called Saul, and do you remember what led to his conversion? In Acts chapter 9, in verse 3 it says, and by the way, Paul, you know what he was doing? He was going around persecuting and killing Christians, thinking he was doing the work of God. And it says in verse 3, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus connects so closely with you. He feels what you feel. He is in tune with everything in your life. The Bible says we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Jesus said when we follow him, we will suffer affliction for his name's sake because Satan and the world hate Christ. And now, notice that Paul says that he fills up in his flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, not the death of Christ or the cross or the suffering or the payment of sin. It's the afflictions. And the suffering of Paul and any other believer who suffers for the cause of Christ is actually edifying to the church. We're, do you know, we are encouraged, for example when someone sacrifices for the sake of Christ. It's motivating when you hear of, for example, a missionary faithfully suffering to bring the hope of the gospel to others. It can build up your faith. And this is why Paul says in verse 24 that he is rejoicing in his own afflictions for Christ. He's rejoicing because he knows that by his calm endurance and his clear testimony through trial, that the church will be established and built up in the faith. It's a poor analogy, but it really is kind of like a quarterback that gets blindsided and sacked with a dirty hit by the opposition, the opposing team, and his nose is bloodied and he's knocked down, and then he just jumps right back up and he says, Come on, guys. It's motivating. It's inspiring to the rest of the team. Verse 25, Paul says, I have become its servant, that is the gospel, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Now that means that the plan of God had not yet been fully revealed. We're only going to cover two more verses, and this is really cool. For hundreds of years, all through the Old Testament, God had progressively revealed himself and his plan. He had progressively shown different aspects of who he was and what he was doing and his plan for humanity. It began through the Jewish nation, Israel, that he had selected and he had separated them out from all other nations. They had received the law so that man knew what was right and wrong. There were feasts to celebrate that all symbolized what was to come. There was a whole sacrificial system set up and a priesthood so man knew he couldn't just approach God. He needed a mediator, a go-between. He needed a sacrifice. There were many, many things that God, step by step, kept revealing to man. But the Bible, God's story, wasn't yet complete. 
and the plan of God had not yet been fully revealed. And now, in this verse, Paul gets to fully develop it and bring completion to the revelation. And here it is. Verse 26. The mystery. Now, mystery means uh, something had, that had not yet been revealed. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. That's you. The mystery was not some secret teaching like the Gnostics were looking for. It wasn't some ceremony. The mystery instead was a person, a truth that would have remained unknown had not God revealed it. It had been hidden from man. It was in the plan of God, but it hadn't been historically realized. And now it was being revealed or made known to born again believers. Here is the mystery, verse 27, and this is a mountain peak verse in the Bible. We so don't appreciate this, but if you would have been living back then or any time in the hundreds of years before then, your mouth would have fallen open and your mask would have fallen off. Look at it, verse 27. To them, that's you. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, the dog, the scum, not the chosen ones, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I, I, I do not have words to say how blessed, how fortunate, how amazing, how awesome, how wonderful it is. In the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, up until Christ came to this earth, God's Spirit, the Shekinah glory, dwelt in the temple. Or if he came upon a man like David, it, would, it was for a temporary time. God's Spirit would come upon him and he would prophesy or whatever. That's, but he... The Spirit of God came and went as he determined. That's why David, when he sinned, said, God, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. But now everything has changed. Listen to Romans 16, 26. But now as the prophets foretold, and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere so that they too, might believe and obey him. Ephesians 3, 6 says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers, participants, together in the promise of Jesus Christ. The mystery is Christ himself. Christ in all his glorious riches actually dwelling through his spirit in the hearts and lives of all who would believe. Jew and Gentile, one body, Christ church, the wall of partition broken down where there would be no distinctions. Moses that great man of God and the Old Testament knew nothing of the idea of Christ's church. It's been revealed to us. The great heroes of the Bible, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they didn't know about this. The lawgivers like Moses, the leaders like Joshua, the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, the kings like David and Solomon, it's been revealed to you. Even to the apostles, during Christ's earthly life, the mystery was hidden. Before Paul's conversion, he would have been shocked at this as a blasphemous heresy. The mystery was that 
the glory, the person of Christ himself. Not just his teaching or just his works, not just his example, but Jesus himself in us as his temple. And it also means then what we can now look forward to in the future because Christ is in us and we are in him. And that's why verse 27 then says, the hope, that word hope means confident, ardent expectation of glory, full redemption, salvation, completed. Imagine, imagine new incorruptible bodies incapable of sinful thoughts or actions. Imagine timeless, holy, without blemish, you. Unreproachable, you. Forever without charge or condemnation. Forever in the presence of God. Whatever you may be suffering through in this brief time on earth, particularly if you are suffering for doing right, particularly for that, but whatever you are going through, remember Romans 8, 18. Paul says, our present suffering not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Remember how we started in verse 21 with being alienated and enemies with God in our minds, but now we have the hope of glory. And that glory is dependent on the glory of Christ, which he won when he triumphed over sin and death on the cross. And he triumphed over the grave in his glorious resurrection. When God says that now I will never leave you or forsake you, that we need to take that in more deeply than ever. When God says I keep your tears, I keep track of them. When God says that no temptation has come upon you, but that which is common to man and God is faithful and not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape. When God says to you that he is interceding for you, that he is praying, Christ is praying for you. Romans 8.11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives circle there, in you. When he says he will give you wisdom, when he says he will guide and direct you, when he says he will comfort you, he will encourage you, he will counsel you, he will convict you, he will do everything that you need. He lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. The Bible says now in this new time, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And this, this is how his adequacy can satisfy my every inadequacy. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Will you say that with me? Christ in me, the hope of glory. Once more. Christ in me, the hope of glory. This is why the promises are true. This is why Philippians 4.13 takes on an entirely new import. I can do all things through Christ who literally infuses inner strength into me. Everything 
of importance that we ever need is found in a relationship with Jesus. Let's pray together and Our Father, we stand amazed at your plan, how wonderful it is. We stand in awe of how far-reaching your love for us is. Lord, we pray that you, by your grace and your power, would enable us to continue in the faith as we should being firm and established with an eye on heaven to come. God, we give you praise that your love was so far-reaching that you gave your son for us. That whoever would simply believe and trust in him alone would be your child, forgiven, forever reserved in heaven and empowered to live this abundant life now. God, we proclaim in our hearts right now as your body, All glory and praise and thanksgiving to you. Help us, Lord, to love you the way you love us. Help us to rest in you. Help us to grow in you. Help us, Lord, to enjoy you, to walk in your light, to trust you to allow you to take away every worry, every anxiety, every fear. Help us to let you love us. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you sing with me? The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and dark tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God they all will see how great How great is our God. Age to age he stands. And time is in his hand. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. God, 
I want to encourage you that uh, midweek we will finish the last couple of verses in your outline and you can go online to see that uh, after Wednesday. I hope you'll do that. It'll only be about eight minutes, but a great midweek pick me up. And uh, also, if you have children uh, school age, fifth grade and below, uh, or if you have grandchildren in that area or neighbors, you know, uh, we are kids uh, kingdom is doing an online uh, a little Bible study, Bible lesson, and uh, other things involved with it, even ways you can do crafts and everything else. But uh, parents and grandparents invest in your children. And uh, so you can go online with that, or if you see me right after church, I can give you more information uh, on how to get connected with that. May the God who knows your beginning from the end May the God whose wisdom is without measure and whose power is unmatchable, may the God whose love and grace is directed at you, may he be uppermost in your heart and mind this week. May he be the very center of all that you think and do and say. May you enjoy him and what he has in store for you this week till we see you next time.